Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 14 of Navigating New Space, produced by the Matthew Isakowitz Fellowship Program. MIFP is a highly selective internship, mentorship, and networking program that guides the next generation of leaders into commercial space exploration. MIFP is running this segment in order to help prospective applicants and other people interested in the program learn what our fellows, mentors, and affiliates are all about. My name is Shana Hume, and I'm a 2018 fellow of the program. Today, I am so excited to have Dr. Garrett Reisman joining us. Dr. Garrett Reisman is currently a professor of astronautical engineering at USC and a senior advisor at SpaceX. He was selected by NASA as a mission specialist astronaut in 1998. His first mission was aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavour. In 2008, which dropped him off for a 95-day mission aboard the International Space Station, after which he returned to Earth aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. His second mission was aboard the Space Shuttle Atlantis in 2010 and returned Garrett once again to the ISS. During those missions, Garrett performed three different spacewalks, operated the space station robotic arm, and was a flight engineer aboard the space shuttle. After leaving NASA in 2011, Garrett joined SpaceX, where he is now the director of space operations, preparing the company for human spaceflight. Garrett, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it so much. Hey, Shana, no problem. Uh, pleasure to be here. Great job scheduling this too. I'm glad we picked a week when there's like nothing else going on. So a lot of people be trying Yeah, to no. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to be doing anything else on the internet right now. I am certainly not going to be refreshing uh, my own internet at the end of this. <laughs> I know. Oh, one, one thing I, I should I should correct though is that I'm no longer the director mm. of space operations at SpaceX. I stepped down from that position uh, about two and a half years ago. And uh, when I took when I became a professor at USC. Uh, I'm still a, an advisor there, kind of a consultant thing, but, uh, but I'm no longer yeah. in that position. I can, awesome. I can, Thank I can, you for I, correcting I, that. I was on your LinkedIn earlier today. Oh, yeah, I got to update that LinkedIn. And uh, I can, but I can verify it. I, I, <laughs> they're not, I, I don't have any paychecks from them anymore. So I could, I could, sure, I could prove it. Good to know. Well, I would love to know, uh, first of all, you know, you have so many different parts of your career that I would love to ask you questions about. And if anyone listening has questions, please drop them in the comments and I would be so happy to bring them up. But before we get to that, how did you get involved with MIFP and how many years have you been involved with the program? Uh, yeah, Matt's dad kind of reached out to me. <laughs> That's how I got involved. Uh, Steve, he he, uh, he and I were yeah. way back at NASA, and uh, uh, he knew where to find me at SpaceX. So um, he got a hold of me, and uh, you know, in the beginning when I was still at SpaceX as a full time, it was kind of crazy, and and it was hard to fit it in. But I'm really glad. Uh, one of the benefits of uh, now being uh, having this professor job is that I have a little bit more time, and so I've been a mentor now this year, and and um, been involved with the program in some form or another for for a couple of years now. That's fantastic. And what has it been like to be a mentor in this program uh, for those who are wondering what they might get out of it? Well, you know, it's an awesome program. And of course, this year, my first year as a mentor is not your standard kind of normal year. Uh, yeah. I think I, I first got in touch with my mentee just pretty soon after COVID hit us. And um, so normally, <laughs> you know, it'd be nice to have them come by USC, uh, maybe go uh, and, and spend some, you know, get some coffee or something, but that wasn't really an option. So we've, we've had some, a lot of phone calls and chats and we're doing the best we can given the situation, just like all of us are doing in our lives these days. Um, but you know, the, the, the program is, is outstanding. And, and, and uh, for anybody who's lucky enough to get selected, um, it, it's such a great opportunity. I know you can, you can speak to it from your personal experience, Shana, but uh, I, I, I just, from the outside looking in as a mentor, I could, I could say like, wow, it would have been, awesome if I had the opportunity <laughs> to do this when, when I was a, uh, you know, a, a graduate student, uh, it would have been really cool, but it wasn't, you know, around these kinds of things didn't exist back then. Yeah, for sure. What kind of mentorship did you find early in your career that particularly helped you? Well, that's an interesting question. So, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I had a couple professors or even going, you know, first of all, going way back, my, my father was, uh, uh, a, a mechanical engineer and he never pushed me to like follow in his footsteps. Um, and, uh, but I just kind of subconsciously wanted to be like my dad, you know, 
And so uh, I, I, early on, that was my role model for sure. I had my, well, my whole life, it was uh, my role model. And, um, but then, you know, I had teachers along the way and professors at, 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 as an undergraduate. And then uh, my, my PhD advisor at, at Caltech was a huge influence on me too, Chris Brennan. Um, and, and so there are a lot of people uh, all along my career uh, that really helped me out and, and, and without their advice and guidance uh, and recommendations, I never would have done all the things that I did. So yeah, mentorship is really important. Um, and I was lucky enough to, for, for great mentors to just come, a, come across my path and, 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 and were kind enough to spend time with me. And I try to give back now whenever I can. Uh, and uh, because that, that is such, a, it's such an important thing for, for a young person trying to make their way. Yeah, I completely agree. Obviously, the people who have already acted as mentors to me have meant the world to me. For those getting started, uh, this is a question I remember I asked a few interviews ago when we had another mentor on. It can seem very intimidating to form some kind of mentorship relation when you don't feel like you have much to offer and it feels like you're just asking for help getting started in your career. What do you think are some good ways that people can approach that? Well, you know, I think with me, it makes it a little bit easier. I'm, I'm only about five and a half feet tall, so it's hard for me to be that intimidating, you know. But uh, it, 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 I, I've been there, and I remember, oh, man, I remember, like, meeting General Tom Stafford when I was a graduate student to try to get some advice from him about becoming an astronaut. And I remember being completely intimidated. And, and uh, uh, I, th I think the main thing is to realize, I remember I, remember I went up to uh, – uh, another astronaut I talked to to try to get advice was uh, um, uh, George Lowe, and and um, he, um, he, I ran into him at JPL once, and uh, I said, "Hey, uh, I, I want to get your job," and and he was like, "Well, I'm not done with it yet, you know." <laughs> and I'm like, "No, it's okay. I'm willing to wait. I'm, I got, I got, I'm only, I'm only, you know, a first year graduate student. I got time." So. Um, it, 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 I guess the main thing to realize is that uh, there are all, all these people that you might be really intimidated by or whoever you get assigned to as a mentor in the program might seem super intimidating, but they're human beings. We all are. And um, at the end of the day, you know, you want to be respectful. You don't want to be arrogant. I mean, it's the same, the same advice I would give anybody on like how to make friends is like, don't be a jerk. And, and as long as you do that, then, then don't be, don't be shy, you know, cause they're just people and, and they have interests and, and they have senses of humor, most of us, you know? And, and um, so, so yeah, don't just be yourself. That's some great advice. Absolutely. One thing that I wanted to bring up, uh, you mentioned that obviously this has been your first year mentoring and it has been very different. This might be taking it off on a tangent, but people have been making jokes about it all year. How much is quarantine like being in space? Mm -hmm. Is this preparing us all to be astronauts now? Yeah, you know, when we all went into quarantine first, I, I gave a bunch of seminars online where I talked about like techniques we use for coping uh, with isolation and confinement on the space station and how we train for that, you know, and that was a big difference was we knew it was coming. We had years to prepare. It wasn't a surprise. The difference here with COVID is that uh, all of a sudden it was like, okay, everybody go into quarantine. There was no like warning or, or that this was coming. So that, that made it very different, but a lot of it's the same, you know, um, self care, self management is still super important. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, being extra sensitive, uh, with your behavior towards the other people that you're in quarantine with and keeping busy and productive and, and, uh, that, that contributes to your own sense of, of well-being. That's really important. So there, there are a lot of things that we train to do on the space station along those lines. And, and we realize that keeping crews on long duration missions happy, is really important to keep them productive and busy and not just with, with like trivial busy work just, you know, for the sake of busy work, but the stuff where you feel like you're making some progress or making a contribution is really important. Um, and, you know, some of the lessons we learned from the, the work we do with the National Outdoor Leadership School or Knowles, we do a lot of expeditionary training with them where we learn how to, you know, things about leadership and followership, but also um, being a good uh, expeditionary crew member, what we call expeditionary behavior uh, which includes self-management, self-care. So there, there's, there are a lot of things that, 
Uh, there's a lot of similarities, except the, the view is not quite so good. And sometimes we don't manage the two hours of working out a day that you guys did. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier when somebody makes you do it. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, I imagine. Well, that's very cool to hear. Let me quickly check the comments coming in. A few people have sent things in. Uh, Hossein asked about what it was like to switch to the commercial space industry. And we got a question about USC. So why don't we wait and field those at the end? Since I have questions uh, about a little bit earlier in your career first. Okay. Okay, awesome. Uh, so you started as an astronaut in 1998 then, right? That's right. Yeah, I got selected uh, in, in 98 uh, when I was a guidance navigation control engineer working at TRW, which is now uh, Northrop Grumman down there in Space Park, Redondo Beach. Got it. So you came from private space ahead of becoming an astronaut already then? Yep. Yeah, I was, I was uh, working on a control system for a satellite we were building for NASA Goddard. Uh, which Very was a cool. really fun, fun job. That was cool. Yeah, I can imagine. What was it like watching new space grow? Because, you know, there is a distinct difference between the new companies that are emerging and a lot of the traditional commercial space guard. Uh, you probably saw a lot of that growth between the time you first became an astronaut and your first flight. What was that progress like? Yeah, you know, I, I saw more of it. It really started picking up around the time of my second flight um, in 2010. Mm -hmm. So Around that time, that's when SpaceX really started uh, working on the Falcon 9 and, and really started uh, making some good progress. And, and, and that caught my attention. In fact, it caught our whole crew's attention. So this, this crew here that you see and, and, and the patch over there, that was my last flight on Atlantis in 2010. And we um, uh, were down there at the Cape waiting for the, the vehicle to roll to the pad. And I know this will come as a huge surprise, but lo and behold, it actually rained uh that in florida in the afternoon in the summer and and so the, the crawl, i know i know that like never happens right <laughs> so the crawler way was too soggy for the giant stack to roll out to the so we had a we had a day off which is kind of very rare we had a, a compressed time frame so we were very busy but we had this day off and they asked us what we wanted to do and one of the things we said was hey we heard that this this company spacex that we've heard a bunch about we heard they got this launch pad they're building over at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Can we go check that out? So they called up and they said, come on over. And we did. And as a crew, we walked around that launch pad and met with some of these SpaceX engineers and technicians that were building it. And we were super impressed, all of us, with how quickly they were coming along and just the scale of the work. You know, back then, I think the, the popular uh, impression out there was like SpaceX, where was like Elon and a couple of the guys in the garage, you know, building rockets with with hammers and vice grips or something and and so when we went out there and we saw like this huge launch pad that was there was no kidding you know real rocketry and then we saw how quickly it was coming together and how smart they were being about their design and, and repurposing and they were being very scrappy and innovative and in how they were repurposing old older materials and that uh, and equipment that was uh, discarded basically um, but they're able to refurbish and use very effectively. And, and we looked at all this and we we're like, wow, you know, this is happening so fast and, and it's so impressive. And, and we thought like, there's no way given, given our way of doing things at NASA that this would ever happen this quickly and this efficiently. And, and so I was really impressed. And then when I came back from the mission, I called up a, a friend of mine, uh, Ken Barrosox, who was the VP of um, safety and mission assurance at, at, at SpaceX at the time. And said, look, I saw the launch pad. I'd like to see more. Can I come visit you in California? So he said, sure. And so I flew out and uh, stopped by and he gave me a tour of Hawthorne. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really opened my eyes because then I saw the real scope and, and the ambitions of the place and, 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 the, and, and just the energy. And I got really, really excited about it. So I did something kind of hard. I gave up like the best gig in the world, which is being an astronaut, which where they pay you to go to the gym and fly airplanes and stuff. I mean, it was pretty awesome. I know you're flying in space too. Uh, and and I, I, I said, you know, um, and I met with Elon and I, I had a job interview with him. And I said, you know what? Um, I really like what you're doing here. I'm excited by it. Uh, I, you know, I'd love to come work for you and help in any way I can. And he said, okay, let's do this. And, and, and that, that was that pretty much. 
That is incredibly cool. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, so many elements of that are awesome. I think a lot of the fellows and people who are would-be fellows listening to this potentially would kill to be able to go back to the early days of SpaceX and see what they were doing in Hawthorne and at Cape Kennedy. Yeah, and that wasn't even the early, early days. I mean, the early, early days was like mm. the quad and the trailer launching Falcon 1. Uh, uh, those are the, the but, but even 2010, uh, at that point, we only had, I think, uh, really established. Yeah, I mean, I think at that point, we only had uh, two Falcon 9 launches under our belt. So it was still really early on, and anything, you know, nobody really knew how it was all going to work out. So it was still pretty exciting. I was employee number 1440, I think when I first got there. So um, uh, I was, it was still pretty early in the, in the, in the, in the life cycle of the company. Yeah. Not one of the easiest numbers to remember, but still, you know, decent. <laughs> yeah. It might've been 1441 or 40, whatever it takes. Yeah. I, I, it was somewhere. <laughs> you were an employee there and that's what matters. Yeah. Very cool. So you mentioned something just a few minutes ago uh, that reminded me. I was watching your appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast because I heard you told some really funny stories about, you know, your EVAs. And that was a lot of fun to watch. But you mentioned a story then that reminded me of something you said just now. Um, in the story, you were talking about how being shorter made it harder to fit into a spacesuit and made it harder to, you know, operate because it was just a little bit bulky. And that also kind of just making all the connections reminded me of the all-female spacewalk last year and how it said uh, in a lot of news articles that that didn't happen for a long time because they didn't have two small slots, two small size spacesuits at the same time available. Well, it's complicated. Yes and no. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's uh, unfortunately it, it, the, the true the truth behind all that is is too complicated to make a nice concise newspaper article. So. I don't think that that really got out there. It is true that actually there is no small. The smallest mm. size they make in the hard upper torso is a medium. And okay. I, they actually, I got recruited to try to um, to make it non-gender specific to be a test subject for the, they did develop a prototype small. And I almost dislocated myself, uh, my shoulders trying to get into that thing because I wanted to help out. And, and, and uh, but the thing is that the, the true important dimension is actually not your, your standing height um, mm. or, or any, it's actually the, the distance between the, your, the, your, your shoulder joint the, from one shoulder joint mm. to the other, like armpit to armpit, basically this distance, if you can see that right there, that distance. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so th that's like the really, the, the, the most, the most important dimension. And for me, I'm, I'm, I'm short, but I'm kind of wide. So, so it actually worked out all right for me. And I actually ended up running in a, not even a medium. I actually did my EVAs in a large, um, and, and the thing is that a lot of times you do like what I, I started doing practicing for my EVAs in a medium because I filled it up more. And when you're in the pool, you know, the, the neutral buoyancy laboratory where we practice spacewalks, uh, any air that's inside the suit with you allows you to shift around and it messes up your way out. So then you have a writing moment that, he, that, that they have to fight in the water. Um, and, 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 and so it, it, so it makes it more difficult to really uh, simulate zero gravity and, 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 and it makes you work harder. So, so I, you tend to, you tend to, in the beginning, wear like the tightest size you can so that, that it makes that better. Then you get up to space and you realize, Oh, uh, I don't have to worry about buoyancy anymore, you know? And, and so <laughs> a little more room is nice. And, and so I, that's why I went from a medium to a large. Well, the same thing happened with the, with one of the, I think it, I'm trying to remember which of the women it was, but one of them, when I got up to space, realized that uh, you know large would be better, and and so mm. you don't. So that that's a that's a significant thing, and it. But it, but on the other hand, that meant they actually were limited in how many larges that they had. I, I believe, if I remember correctly. So oh, no way. There was that change in size, which is a totally normal and it, it kind of unsurprising result, is what led to not having two of the correct size suits on board to do it with the two women at the time without like taking the suits apart and moving back the backpacks around and stuff. So it's complicated. Uh, so it, yes, it's, it, yes. It, so there's two truths that there's, there's, there's two truths to this. And one is that there was a suit mismatch that delayed the first all female spacewalk, but it's not because they didn't have a suit to fit them. They just, they just mm -hmm. changed sizes and they weren't ready for that. 
Uh, the second thing that is true is that there is no small and that more women would do better uh, and, and more narrow shouldered people, non-gender specific would do better in training if we had a small. So those are all, those are all true statements, but linking them together is not necessarily, you know, it, the lack of a small is not what caused that problem on that day. Good clarification. And that's super interesting to learn the difference between what it's like at the buoyancy lab and up in space. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of similarities. They do a great job. It's really great training, but, but it's not exactly the same though. Awesome. So we just got another question from the audience. I'll pull this one up on screen. This is pretty relevant since, you know, uh, you mentioned that in your first year of grad school, you already kind of knew you wanted to be an astronaut. But originally, I think you studied at the Fisher program at UPenn doing economics and mechanical engineering. Yeah, that's true. When, when I came out of high school, yeah. I was 100% sure what I wanted to be when I grow up. I, I would not at that point have said astronaut, if you asked me. Mm -hmm. I definitely would not have. Um, I was interested in a lot of different things. I was interested in a lot of STEM fields. I was interested. I, I might have said I want to be a doctor when I grow up. Or I want to be, um, you know, an engineer. Or I might have said, hey, I, I might want to be like a, a, a manager, a, you know, uh, uh, in business. And, and so I really had a bunch of different interests. And that's why I, that program looked great to me because I can explore both of those avenues. Um, and and um, and so and, and actually that, that by the way, Elon Musk took didn't wasn't in exactly the same program, but he also did a Wharton and physics. I did Wharton and engineering. He did Wharton and physics, business and physics. So he did a very similar thing at Penn. And uh, it's a great program. And it, and it was it was really helpful to me. But um, but the reason I would not not have said astronaut when I was in high school is that when I was looking as a kid, at like these films of like the Apollo missions and stuff and the early shuttle missions, I was seeing basically all military test pilots as astronauts. So I figured, well, you gotta be a test pilot. And I had a mom that was scared of flying. And I don't mean like flying on like an X-16 or, or F-16 or, you know, a, 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 as a test pilot. I mean like flying on like United, okay? She's like scared of airlines. So the thought of her letting me go off and becoming a test pilot, that was like not going to happen. So I just, I never really thought it was within the realm of possibility. Then what happened was I was, um, as an undergrad, I was uh, at, at Penn, I was um, got a hold of some of the bios of some of the astronauts that were just selected for the shuttle program back in that, in that year. And, um, and I looked and I was like, oh man, there are, there are scientists, there are engineers, there are medical doctors. And I was like, maybe I had this all wrong. Maybe this is within the realm of possibility of something I could do as a job. And that was really the, what flipped the switch in me and made me think that I still thought it would never happen because the odds, I knew that I'm pretty good at math. Okay. And so I knew that <laughs> the probability was very low. And um, so, but I figured, well, it's not zero. So I'm going to at least try because the only way it's zero is if you don't apply. So, which is a good lesson for anybody out there thinking about applying to this uh, fellowship uh, program. Uh, but anyway, I did. I applied and uh, got incredibly lucky. And then uh, the, the rest, uh, all the rest. Awesome. When you mentioned the odds, uh, I was at a talk by, I believe, Richard Cifos uh, back at Kennedy a long time ago now, maybe six or seven years. Not really sure. Don't quote me on it. And I'm pretty sure he used the metaphor of a lottery. Like you want to be involved in space exploration, but becoming an astronaut is kind of like winning the lottery. You buy tickets for it. Sure. You try to get involved, but there's no guarantee. Would you agree with that? Do you think that astronaut is a valid career path that you can say you want to do for sure? No, <laughs> you should. I mean, it, 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 it's it's too. Uh, I mean, yeah, in, in the same way that uh, you can say like, well, uh, my my jo my job, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a job and my my one and only goal, which I will accept is winning a Nobel Prize. I mean, yeah, it might happen. <laughs> it's great if it does. But you, you have to have a plan A, and that's really important. Um, your plan A should should be something that that uh, I always tell people when you make a major decision uh, and you're thinking about applying to be an astronaut, take the astronaut thing out of the equation and just say, what would I do if if there was no rockets? If we never invented a rocket, what would I do with with my career? And um, you know, if the astronaut thing was just not going to happen, so 
So that's that's kind of a logical way to go about it. it ironically, it actually helps you as a candidate. I, I've been on the selection board. So I can tell you that like when people come in and their whole life is about trying to become an astronaut, and they run, and, and they run around and they like take some Russian language lessons. They get their private pilot license, but they're just checking boxes because they're trying to build a resume to be an astronaut. And they don't really have their passion uh, in any of, in, in, in all of those things. They do it for that sake. It, it's easy to, to it's easy to detect that, you know, so it kind of backfires. And, and ironically, if you follow plan A, and then say, you know, I'm going to apply. And if it works out, that will be a super duper surprise. I'll win the lottery. That, that is a good way of thinking of it. Um, then great. But if it doesn't work out, I'm going to be super happy and successful because I'm doing something I love to do. That's where you want to be. Absolutely. Uh, we got another question from the audience that's pretty relevant to what you just said. Uh, you mentioned, you know, looking at being on the selection committee. And was there anything that surprised you, either from the applicant perspective or later on from the other side of the table about the process? Hmm. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think I know this guy, Dylan. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, but, uh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, so um, but anyway, the uh, yes, as far as what surprised me about the process, I would say a couple things. One. I didn't realize how much fun the interview week was going to be. I mean, even if I never got selected, it was such a great experience. And I met some really impressive people, some of whom I'm still friends with today, uh, just from that, that crazy experience of the 20 of us running around going to our interviews together. And um, so, so it was, you know, it was really an amazing, uh, at, back then it was just a week. Now, now it's multiple weeks. Um, and multiple trips down to Houston, but back then it was just one, and and it was it was really fun, um, it, very ex super exciting. So even if you don't make it, just going down for the interview is 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 worth it. Plus, you get like really good health care. <laughs> so like, a little too good. That, that was a bit surprising too. <laughs> they they poked and prodded and and a little more than I would have uh, preferred. One. How much is it like, uh, you know, the book and the movie and the new TV show, The Right Stuff? Is it that uncomfortable still? No, I mean, so I haven't seen the new TV show, uh, but I watched the movie and I read the book. And I could tell you that some of that stuff of like like holding the the, the ping pong ball suspended, like as long as you can. Yeah. Or, or spinning around in a crazy thing for g tolerance and uh, you know mm -hmm. uh no we don't we don't necessarily so not that good health care no not that good no not that good but uh but you, they still they, they, they you know it, it look it's it's you know we've we've come a bit uh a, a, a you know a long way in our medical technology since the 1950s so so yeah instead of like make uh spinning around in that crazy device they just they just do an mri <laughs> <laughs> So, but it's changed it a little bit. simpler and a lot more pleasant. Yeah. Well, yes and no. It depends, you know, as claustrophobic you are. But they test you for that too, by the way. Yeah, I would imagine, you know, you don't want someone who has severe anxiety on claustrophobia on the ISS. No. So what they do, I think they still do this. They, when you go down there, they stick you in this ball and uh, they zip yeah. it up. They, they give you some airflow and they give you a microphone and a headset. And it's in this little tiny booth. And then they close the door, they turn out all the lights. And they don't tell you when they're coming back, and they they monitor your call, your heart rate to see if you freak out. And um, I started falling asleep multiple times. I kept yeah, I was going to ask, can you just take a nap the whole time? That's what I did, and it kept waking yeah. me up. And they're saying that I'm invalidating the test. I have to be conscious, and I'm like, well, if I go fall asleep in here. I think I validate myself. I think we're done. And, <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I want more proof you need, but they they kept waking me up. It was the most relaxing part of the whole week, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> That's awesome. That sounds like a really fun experience, uh, you know, loosely akin to what the MIFP Summit is like. Just a very intense couple of days, whirlwind, uh, where you bond a lot with the people unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Experiences awesome. like that are great because you, it, it does forge some really close friendships and really good relationships. Definitely. So this question came from the audience a little bit ago, and I'll come back to it now. When you were at your dream job, you know, you were an astronaut and you decided to leave in 2011. What was the reasoning behind that? And what made you want to make the jump to SpaceX? Well, I just saw this potential. So it was two things. One, one I saw 
this incredible potential of uh, commercial space and, and this, this new paradigm that was going to promise a rapid uh, state of advancement, technological advancement, but also accomplishment that was going to be a trajectory more akin to what was happening during uh, Apollo that I missed out on because I wasn't born yet. So, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I saw this happening and I, I just wanted to be a part of it. The other thing was conversely, you know, uh, uh, this flight on Atlantis was the, I'm sorry, this flight on Atlantis was the penultimate flight of Atlantis. It only flew one more time where SDS 132, it flew again on SDS 135 and that was it. So I knew that the shuttle program was coming to an end and I could have stuck, stuck around. I had, uh, they were, they were already slotting me in for a, sorry, <laughs> they're already slotting me in for, uh, a commander slot, and I would have gotten to fly in the Soyuz and be a commander of the ISS, which would have been new. But you know, I, I kind of accomplished and, and and had the the experiences that I, I all all the ones I could have hoped for. I got to do EVAs and robotics and be a flight engineer on the shuttle, long duration crew member on the station. So, uh, you know, it, it, I and and even though I had this slot, it was going to take a long time because there are a whole lot of us now, and now without the shuttle flying, there weren't that many opportunities. Now there's just some, a couple of Soyuz seats every year. So I figured, well, rather than sit around here and also where I was in, in, in my career at the time, I was still young enough that I could consider starting another type of career and a whole nother phase. And I wasn't ready to, you know, to kind of just, you know, take a, take a, uh, um, you know, hit the golf course and retire. So, so I figured I better do this now while I have the energy uh, to to really throw myself into a, a, a really intense job like 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 working at SpaceX um, before it's before I get too old <laughs> for that. So yeah. that's what I was thinking. That makes total sense. Were there any hiccups along the way or surprises that came when you switched from spacecraft user to spacecraft designer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, life got very different. Um, so just going from NASA to SpaceX was 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 big uh, was big enough, but going from uh, being a, a, an operator to to being kind of uh, on the management side of things that was a huge change. So I remember originally I, I, I was going to work for um, Ken Barasak, so my job title was some very nondescript kind of generic. I think I was a safety and mission assurance engineer was my job title theoretically, and then literally on my first day at SpaceX, my very first day. Elon called me into his office and said, hey, you know, we bid on this contract with NASA's commercial crew contract if we win it. Uh, and this was the early days. This was CC Dev 2. So this is the beginning stages of the commercial crew program. Um, but he said, hey, if we win this thing, I need somebody that can kind of manage this, this project. Can you do that? And I said, sure. You know, how hard can that be? And, and turns out it's really hard. <laughs> so, yeah. Something about uh, rocket science or something. Yeah, no, it, that's the easy part. It was the like managing the the people and 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 all the um, you know, just trying to hold it all together and meet the deadlines and get all these documents, you know, whatever. Just all all the all, all the things that go along with running a, a project like that. It was it was super hard, it, and and uh, so I was I was a little too quick to jump on that grenade, but but I did. I said yeah, and 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 so I did that, and then I ended up. Um, running our proposal team. So we then we went on to the higher and the, the program kept growing and, and the contracts get getting bigger and bigger. So after CC Dev 2, we applied for CCI cap and I ran our proposal team that put together our proposal for that contract and we won. And then we got and then and then I, I, I helped manage that for a little bit. And then I went off to do CCT cap, which actually is that these these are terrible names, by the way, these contracts. <laughs> they, they sound like somebody's login password or something. But um, the CCT cap is actually the big contract. That was a two point six billion dollar contract that SpaceX won uh, to to get us to where we are today. To actually all the way through flying Bob and Doug, and even through the first couple of operational missions, like this one we're coming up in, in just over a week, uh, Crew One. Uh, so so we won that big contract, and um, and at that point is when I said, okay, you know, now we're getting serious. Now, when when there are billions, when it says billions at the end of the uh, at the end of the price tag, that that we're kind of getting serious about this. So, um, so maybe we should stand up an operations group uh, that deal with all the human interfaces, both at mission control for the human operators on the ground, but also for the crew inside the vehicle. And Elon said, "Yeah, we sh 
right, that's what sounds like a good idea. So why don't you go do that? So that's what I did. <laughs> gotcha. So creating your own job along the way. Yeah. Well, nice. I didn't want to do any more proposals. I knew that. That, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I just. <laughs> years off my life. You know, you, know, for, uh, you know, like in the Princess Bride, where yeah. you, you just hook up to that vacuum device in the pit of despair and they like take it. <laughs> that's proposals. Off. That's proposals. That's the uh, ultimate, the sound of ultimate suffering is what you hear coming out of the proposal. Thing. So, yeah, I, I didn't like that very much at all. <laughs> this past Monday was the end of proposal season for graduate students. So there's a lot of people who probably empathize with you right now on that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so commercial astronauts, uh, there are going to be a lot of people who, you know, are going to have the same title that you did, but who are going to be coming from an entirely different experience. How do you think, you know, the role of being an astronaut and human spaceflight is going to change with this new influx? Well, it, it, like doing it as a job uh, is, is still pretty, there aren't that many opportunities. That's one, one misperception out there. Um, you know, uh, so Axiom is, is, uh, is a company that is working on, uh, with SpaceX to provide, uh, you know, transportation services to ordinary citizens. I say ordinary citizens, but it's like really rich ordinary citizens. <laughs> so. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, and, and their model is to fly three uh, fair paying um, clients along with one professional astronaut. And so they're going to start doing this uh, relatively soon. And um, so there is that opportunity. So you can be an Axiom astronaut, but I think there's like three of them right now. So there aren't like a whole lot of opportunities there. Uh, SpaceX does not have an astronaut core. We, we talked about that for a while, but the thought was that our vehicles are highly autonomous, and and so we don't need to have our own uh, astronaut core. We can, if if we do uh, uh, private flights, we'll just train our clients to operate the vehicle. And and so there's no like there's no you can't be a SpaceX astronaut. There's no that's not a department of SpaceX right now. Virgin Galactic has um, you know a very manually intensive. It's an it's a, a space plane, so it's got to land. So those are all ex test pilots or, uh, or at least one ex shuttle commander. So those, those, there aren't that many of those jobs and they were kind of all taken. So there are some opportunities and, and Blue Origin, Blue Origin's new shepherd is completely automated. So there's no professional, there's no Blue Origin astronaut corps either. So, um, so there aren't, it isn't like there's all these opportunities to become a corporate astronaut, astronaut. Now you can, if you can buy the ticket, you can go and have the experience, absolutely. But, as far as like careers uh, in 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 uh, in the cockpit, they don't really exist at least not yet. Mm. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, checking in, where wow, there have been so many comments. This is fantastic. <laughs> Looking yeah. through them now, uh, wow, there are so many. We're not going to nearly get through all of these. Kyle had a few questions. One was specific about USC, which I'll just refer back to uh, quickly because it's grad application season and it's nice to help people out. His first one asked, should people who are applying for a PhD at USC contact professors? I would assume that's a heavy yes because that's what everyone told me to do when I was applying for grad school. Oh yeah, yeah. You definitely want to get yeah. a professor because you want to find a. Uh, you, you're going to need a, a advisor for your thesis, mm -hmm. and you want to find somebody that's a good match, and 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 that's that's really important. It's actually, I think, finding a good advisor is more important than finding a, the right school, um, just because yeah. the, the the impact that that one person has on your on your career as a graduate student is is huge. Awesome. And the second question: Do you want to go back into space? Sure, but you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of in a different position now. I've got kids, and and I remember I, I gave a talk, and I was wearing my blue flight jacket, uh, and I came home in time to to tuck my son into bed, and he, this was several years ago, so I think he was like four or five or something, and he said, "Daddy, were you just in space?" I said, "No, nah, I was just giving the talk," um, but he goes. Uh, I, and I said, I said, beside, you know, I, I don't plan to go back, you know, to space unless you want to go and come with me. And he thought about it and he said, but dad, you know, I don't have one of those blue jackets. And I said, <laughs> don't worry, uh, we can get you one that that can be we can solve that. That's that's no problem. Making an extra extra small for kids now. Oh, yeah, you can get all sizes in the gift <laughs> shop. No problem. 
<laughs> true, true. I haven't been to one of those in forever. Uh, I miss it far hazy for that reason. <laughs> Okay, uh, so one more question as we're wrapping up from the audience. Everyone has been asking so many, I swear, they could have covered this whole interview by themselves. <laughs> so uh, where was it? Uh, Hossein also asked, what was the transition like to becoming a professor at USC and what really drove that decision for this portion of your career? Wow, yeah, that's a good question. So there's, there's a bunch of reasons there. I, I was at SpaceX for seven years and, mm -hmm. and that's a decent, amount of time um, and, and probably exceeds the, the average tenure there. So, so it, it's a pretty intense place. I mean, it, it's not a, it's a place where you really are trying to change the course of humanity's future. So it's not a place where you get it like a lot of time off and, uh, and, and, and get to do a whole lot of other things. So I, I, and after, after doing that for that amount of time, I figured it was time to move on and let somebody else, uh, have a chance to to take the group in maybe a different direction or take it to the next level. So um, so it's for those reasons and this opportunity came along at the same time at USC to join the faculty. And I always thought about going back to academia at some point and teaching, which I've been really enjoying. And and the other thing is that um, I realized that like there were things that people, there were skills that people were missing uh, when when they came to work for me at SpaceX when I was the director of space operations. So we can, if we needed somebody to do some flight software coding for us, uh, we can just hire anybody coming out of a computer science program and they could code in C++ or Python or whatever, and that was easy. If we need somebody that can do like aerodynamics and do some CFD for us or do some loads analysis, um, do some fluid mechanics and analysis of the turbo pumps, you know, all that stuff was no problem. Uh, we can just grab anybody straight out of uh, one of the top engineering schools, plug them in and, and, and put them to work. But if you needed somebody that can make a spacesuit, eh, or, or like a, a life support system or, or, or the other thing, know what to do when there's a human being in there, uh, especially in, if, if they're anywhere in the control loop and, and have anything to do with operating the vehicle. That was missing. And, and so they, all that stuff people had to learn kind of on the job. And, and so I thought two things. One is like, we have this need, there's this need for people with this experience that, so they can hit the ground running when, when, they, when they go into these uh, positions in these new companies. And two, um, there's, there's opportunity. So like if I would have taken courses, if I would have taken my courses when I was a grad student in, in life support systems, uh, in, in human factors and in, in spacecraft operations, it would have been fun but I couldn't like go out and get a job. Like, uh, you know, we had the space station that was already designed. It really wasn't, and maybe some R and D stuff going on at NASA, but there were very few opportunities. But now my students, they get hired by SpaceX, by Blue Origin, by Virgin, by Boeing, by, by there's a whole bunch of places, Lockheed, there's a whole bunch of places you can go and actually design a human carrying spacecraft these days. So I saw like there's, there was this need and this, there was this opportunity and there was a lack of uh, uh, an academic preparation. So that's what made me think, oh, I could I could put some courses together on specializing in human spaceflight and, uh, and and meet those needs. It's a good time to do it. That makes perfect sense. I can totally see why you did that. Um, no better way to get what you want in industry than to go and actually help people learn it along the way. Right. So I, what my objective is that if you take all three of my classes at the USC, and then old Garrett uh, or previous Garrett hired you, you'd be able to contribute on day one to, to our <laughs> operating group. That's that's kind of the philosophy and how I, I love that. Program. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, so to wrap up now, I want to ask you a question that I've been asking all of our interviewees so far, uh, just to wrap up everything we've been talking about and put it back a little bit in context of the world as it is right now potentially not the world as it is this week uh, in terms of that level of stress. Okay. <laughs> but it has been a very complicated year and there's a lot of different priorities floating around the country, let alone the world. I like to ask people why, for people who are outside the space industry and don't particularly see the value of spaceflight and especially human spaceflight, what are some easy ways to show them the value that comes out of it or to make the argument to them that this kind of space exploration is needed? Well, I mean, right now it's, it's human spaceflight. Um, 
is is a unifying force and we're we're in dire need of unity especially in this country right now uh you, you know we are so divided we were so split up fractioned uh split apart and and but when a, a rocket launches with bob and doug on it uh at least for about 10 minutes everybody can look up there and and feel like we we did something really great and 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 you know it, it's it's of all the bad things that have happened in 2020 and this has not been a very stellar year but but that launch and 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 that successful mission uh, was for me uh, a real high point and and a real positive uh, thing and, and a hopeful view of of what our future might might have in store. So so in a sense of, of bringing unity and hope and and a positive outlook for the future, I think in the short term that's all very important. Now, if you take the extremely long term, on the other hand, if you zoom out and look at like really long uh, uh, timescales. It, it's really about survival of the species because we've, you know, if we're going to, if we find a way not to let our conflicts overwhelm us, and if we find a way not to destroy us and not to not to cause the destruction of the planet through our own activities and through uh, through climate change and or through war, there's a bunch of other ways that we can <laughs> that we can screw this up. But if we don't, if we manage to get past that. Uh, and instead of having that dystopian future, we have a, a, a more utopian future. I really do think that it's that it's 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 unclear uh, at the current time if we're going to have a future that is horrible or like Terminator or something, or if we're going to have a future that's wonderful like Star Trek. And I, I think that either outcome is possible depending on how we get along as human beings. And um, if we do uh, get onto that more hopeful uh, track, where I hope we go. Uh, I think it's inevitable that we end up going to other places inside the solar system, that we end up ha having permanent uh, colonies of humans living on other planets. And, and that might eventually ensure the survival of the species if there is another extinction event here on this planet that either we cause or is, or is something beyond our control. So um, at the end of the day, it's, it's nothing short of um, our long term survival. It's the old joke about why the Dinosaurs, dinosaurs went extinct is because they didn't have a space program. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> becoming a multiplanetary species to save our own species. Yeah, if you look at it uh, at that geological kind of timescale, that's 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 I think that one of the most compelling reasons. Absolutely. Well, Garrett, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today and to pass along so many stories and tidbits of advice along to current fellows, prospective applicants, and anyone else listening. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Good luck, everybody. Stay safe out there. Yeah. And like Garrett said, the odds are zero if you don't apply. So get on that. Applications are due November 13th. And you heard it from him. Apply. You need to do it if you want to have a shot. Thank you everyone so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions about the program before applications are due or in the future, if you watch a recording of this, please get in touch with us. Have a great night, everybody.